So hello everyone and welcome. My name is Kieran and I'm a product owner and software developer at Craftworks in Vienna. I'm here to tell you a little bit today about our journey towards productionizing AI. So it's not going to be an overly technical talk. Um, the goal of the talk is to show you a little bit of how we operate and why we operate the way that we do. So you might be a little bit surprised to see this man. Uh, our journey begins on the same year that this challenge was taking over the world. Um, some of you may remember, uh, it was when we were raising money for charity by dumping ice cold water on our loved ones. Bit of a strange thing to do actually. Uh, does anyone remember the year? I'll give you another hint. There was this absolutely terrifying message shown on your PC and which saw the death of arguably the best operating system that Microsoft has ever made. At least it was my favorite. So it was of course 2014, I know, eight years ago. Makes me feel very old. So whilst that was happening, some, something else more important was happening here in Austria, in Vienna. So introducing Simon and Jakob. Uh, they both studied computer science, have been friends for a really long time and they have a passion for all subjects, uh, technology, software development and IT. And they were together one evening and they were talking and they came to the realization that they didn't have the same passion for their employers that they had for IT. And they weren't sure why that was. And after much deliberation and a couple of beers, uh, it turned out that they came to the conclusion it was because their personal values weren't matched with the company's values and they didn't feel uh, represented as such. And bureaucracy at these, these companies was often uh, stifling creativity and uh, it was a purely transactional relationship, one in which you felt more like a, a number. And so together with another friend, they embarked upon this journey together and they started brainstorming and thinking about uh, a better way of doing it and founding an idea, a company, that would later turn out to be Craftworks. So Craftworks was founded to be a purely traditional software company focusing on building web apps and uh, applications with one clear vision in mind to provide a friendly and professional workplace for developers and by developers. So they started working out of Simon's apartment in true startup fashion and started taking on their first projects. Uh, the first one of which was a transport management system. Uh, this system was responsible for the data exchange uh, with external systems via APIs, managing customers um, and managing logistics. And so the tech stack they used for this first project turned out to be the foundational tech stack that we still use today at Craftworks for our software projects. So for the backend, we mainly use Java and Spring and Spring Boot these days. Uh, for the front end, we use Angular. Uh, for databases, uh, our choice of database is PostgreSQL. And for continuous integration and pipelines, it's Jenkins and Docker to containerize our applications. So they're taking on more and more projects and the journey is going and they come to the next phase. And as word is getting around about the quality of the services and products, um, demand is growing, uh, so supply also has to match this demand since nobody can work 24 hours a day. And customer communication and interaction was becoming a full-time job. So it was important to um, hire a sales team and also look for more colleagues to support us with the front end and eventually also with the back end. So this stage of Craftworks was really um, an, an expansion stage as, as we um, try to match supply with demand. So aside from pure expansion, there was also more substantial change happening. And there's a good quote here from Winston Churchill, to improve is to change and to be perfect is to change often. Obviously nobody's perfect, so take it with a pinch of salt, but there's some important takeaways to take from this, especially in the software industry, as it's ever changing at a fast pace. And if you don't adapt and change with it, you're going to fall behind. And innovation and exploration are some of the key components at Craftworks. 
And with that in mind, we started looking for ways that we could keep up with the market. So we had some in-house machine learning and AI experience. And we realized that we could also benefit our customers um, by improving their processes and systems by going further than conventional software and applying AI and machine learning techniques. And so we started investing time and energy to do so. The first step of which was to hire a data science team um, to support us in these new projects. So for the new data science initiatives, obviously requires a new expertise and a new tech stack for these projects. So for data science projects, we use Python mainly. Um, we use Apache Spark and Pandas for data analysis and data exploration. We use TensorFlow and PyTorch as our deep learning frameworks of choice to train machine learning models and MLflow for tracking experience and uh, for packaging it all together at the end. So here's some example use cases that we've done since. Um, we focus on a, a lot of different industrial use cases from visual inspection to predictive maintenance or predictive quality. Uh, we have one predictive quality uh, mentioned here, for instance, uh, where we try to predict the weight of a plastic pellet passing through an extruder, um, which was a, a, an indication of the quality of the plastic pellet. So it acted like a, a sort of virtual sensor um, to predict the weight rather than using an actual um, scale, because these industrial scales are extremely expensive. And if you want to roll it out at scale, um, it would be very, very costly. So back to our transport management example. Um, we, with our newfound knowledge, we could complement our transport system by going further than just planning with the arrival times that were given to us. We could take it one step further by predicting the estimated arrival times first and further uh, optimizing the process. And so that's exactly what we did for rail cargo. Uh, they tasked us with training a model that could predict the estimated time of arrival for um, cargo shipments. So we were accurately um, able to predict the estimated time of arrival with 98% degree of confidence, which is great, right? This is what happens if you, you, you train a model, um, you have a good result, but now what? Uh, what we often found due to the immaturity of the AI market was that often we invest a lot of time and resources and help customers become more sustainable and more efficient. Um, but after we, the proof of concept is complete, it's dropped and it's moved on to the next thing. So you don't actually get a, a real return of investment and it's not applied um, in the business. And, and so that's quite frustrating for the da data scientists who train the models. And also the businesses aren't seeing their results uh, being used. And in fact, 90% of machine learning models never make it into production. Now, why is this? There's a lot of challenges to productionizing AI. Um, here's just a few of those. Uh, the first one is infrastructure. So as our customers are mainly industrial clients and not necessarily big software players, it could be that they themselves lack the technical infrastructure or the people to maintain that infrastructure. And obviously it needs to then be you know, uh, robust and available at all times. The next one is access management. Uh, you don't, if you're, if you're running a, a model in production, you don't want prying eyes to see your data, obviously. So you need to be able to secure it properly. And you want to separate um, different roles um, with different functions that they can operate on um, by following least privilege so that someone who doesn't know what they're doing doesn't tear down the whole system. <laughs> and Next one is monitoring. So it's important to monitor uh, models that are running in production uh, for out of distribution detection. So this basically uh, means that you're, you're checking for outliers in the data. Um, this could be as a result of something downstream going wrong. Like let's say if a sensor malfunctioned or it, that, that could be a big, big outlier in the data that's coming in, or it could also be something more subtle uh, as your d data uh, will drift over time due to the model being trained on, on a small data set or something like that being an indication that you need to retrain your model because the model is 
only ever going to be as good as the data that's trained on. The next one is de deployments. It's got to be as easy to deploy as possible, which is very difficult because most solutions are custom fit. So there's no one-stop shop for, for these kind of models. So it's very hard to, to make something generic. And also, if, you're, if you want to hand this over to someone who des doesn't necessarily have all of the technical expertise, um, then deployment has to be as easy as possible. And the last one is integration. You don't want to reinvent the wheel every time you have an, uh, an, a new machine learning model. It's got to integrate into existing systems. So whether that be um, via the protocols that they're already using um, or, or um, have the, the, the proper inputs and outputs. So we saw all these problems and this actually gave birth to our new platform, Navio. So Navio is um, a unified MLOps platform that simplifies the serving, monitoring and management of machine learning models. So MLOps here is the combination of machine learning and DevOps. That's exactly what it sounds like. And it's uh, to support the users in the operations surrounding AI and machine learning. And with this, we empower users to start productionizing their models so that maybe if we do a project for them, um, you know, we, we create this, this experiment and um, we can then provide uh, Navio uh, with which they can then further uh, bring them into production and, and um, kind of bridge the gap between experiments and real business value. So some uh, key things to note, um, we have one click deployment in Navio. So it's very, very easy to spin up containers. Um, it, we've got a user interface for everything. So you don't necessarily need someone super technical to, to manage the model once it's been trained and uploaded. Um, it's easily scalable. We can roll it off across uh, many workshop uh, floors. Um, the next thing is simplicity. And for us, it's really important because the users could be domain experts, uh, not necessarily tech savvy. And so it needs to be very obvious and uh, it needs to be often a user interface because they don't want to be sitting there writing loads of commands. And the next one is user centered. Um, which, which tackles the, the infrastructure uh, challenge because we offer it on, on premise and in the cloud. And we've recently also partners, partnered with uh, TT Tech Industrial um, with their Nerf hardware devices so that we can uh, deploy models directly to these devices um, on the workshop floor so that you can get predictions from your models exactly where the data is being produced. So here's a nice diagram and it gives you an indication of how it works. So first the data scientists will train a model using their favorite frameworks, whatever that may be. And we package that model then using MLflow. And the reason for this is so that we can su keep supporting all these different um, deep learning libraries because as we know with our data scientists, every data scientist has their own way of working and their own uh, favorite libraries. Then this gets uploaded to Navio, and then a domain expert, often at the customer side, takes over and can then manage uh, the model and monitor it and make sure uh, everything is, is working correctly. And from Navio, then you, you can um, integrate it into a third party application or um, a machine or mobile phone or whatever that may be. All right, so our journey so far, where we started, traditional software, in an apartment. Then we saw the market shift towards AI. We had mainly industrial customers, so we focused on industrial AI. And then we realized, hmm, we're wasting some resources and we could make our customers more sustainable if we also enable a way to bring these experiments into production. And so that's our current focus. And so we're constantly changes and a lot has changed from our creating software in an apartment. Um, but some things have not changed and we hope will never change. Uh, we still believe in empowering employees and we strive for a friendly and open workplace where you and your work is appreciated. Um, you have the freedom to grow and change. I, for instance, started as a software developer and I'm now product owner as well at Navio. So any motivated employee um, 
can focus on what they do best. And we've come a long way, um, but we still want to change and adapt. Um, so let's see what the future holds. Um, there's really only one thing left to ask, and will you join us on this journey? Because we would love to have you on board. Thank you.